Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, my first time here, and so thank you for the invitation. Um, so I've got six sections to this talk. First section, the background model. Second, structure formation and top-down effects. Third, key issues are unanswered. Fourth, limits of testing. Section five, emergence of complexity. And section six, the deep questions. Now the fifth and sixth ones will be where I'm going to enter substantially controversial territory and I'm sure will generate some um, back reaction from some of our colleagues <laughs> from the workshop which is taking place today. So the background model, scientific cosmology is based on an intricate interplay between theory and observation. There's been an extraordinary flood of data enabled by new technology and a variety of new telescopes. This has enabled determination of a remarkable standard model of cosmology that is generally agreed. And the background model is a Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker universe, or FLRW universe. I'll say more about that in a minute. So the universe is of vast scale. Edward Hubble was the person who laid the foundations for determining this. It is expanding. Friedman and Lemaitre laid the foundations for that. It started off in a hot Big Bang, and George Gamow and um, Jim Peebles were the persons who really set that one off. Structures such as galaxy clusters formed by gravitational attraction and lift shifts was the person who really started that one off. And stars and planets formed in this environment. So from the viewpoint of everyday life, the, the, the reason that universe studying the universe is interesting from the viewpoint of the, of, of the person in the street is that the universe is the environment which is of such a nature that we can come into existence. And as I will discuss, if the universe was substantially different, we would not be able to be here. Now, a galaxy, a typical spiral galaxy, there's about 100,000 million stars. Uh, they all come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. If we use big telescopes, we see massive clusters of galaxies, and you see there the Virgo cluster, a whole set of galaxies out there, and clusters can vary from small to very large. If we look out to the deepest that we can see, the Hubble deep field there, in that we, see, we estimate from this picture about that there are about 200,000 million galaxies in the observable part of the universe, and that is almost certainly an underestimate because many galaxies are under, undetected, but their detection and selection limits would come into play. But basically, virtually every dot of light you see in that picture is a distant galaxy. So this universe is of incredible size, um, absolutely dwarfing humans and human life because each of those galaxies is hugely bigger than the solar system, and the solar system is very, very much bigger than the Earth. So it is awe-inspiring in its size. Now, the major discovery, Einstein started off mathematical cosmology in 1917 with his static model of the universe, and it was shortly followed by the De Sitter static model of the universe. And it's hard to think back now to understand the mindset of that time when all the major scientists knew that the universe was static. <laughs> and they took that for granted, so that it was very, very difficult to break up that straitjacket of thinking that the universe was static. Friedman and Lemaitre were the people who broke out of that straitjacket and started and understood that dynamic models of the cosmos are possible. Eddington showed that static solutions are unstable, so expansion or collapse is inevitable. And this view, now these expanding universe models unify falling apples where gravity calls things to fall to, from this, to the surface of the Earth, the motion of the moon around the Earth and the Earth around the sun, again governed by gravity, and the expansion of the cosmos. These are all governed by the force of gravity, which um, Newton uh, turned into a... a a law that we could use to, 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 for the first two. For the expansion of the cosmos, you can get quite away with Newtonian gravity, but you have to go to general relativity to really deal with the expansion of the cosmos. Now, these dynamic models are observationally testable, and so this is what makes cosmology, it turns it from philosophy into science. Hubble was the first person who laid the grounds for testing cosmology, but curiously, Hubble, to the end of his life, did not believe 
and the expanding universe. And the reason was because Hubble's value for the Hubble constant, the rate of expansion, was wrong by an order of magnitude. And so when he was looking at the expanding universe model, his estimates of the age of the universe were less than the ages of stars in the universe. And that, of course, is not possible. The observational testing was put on a solid footing by Lemaitre, McVitie, Heckman, Sandage, and then many, many other people. But cosmology is limited by visual and causal horizons, which I will say something about. They limit what we can know about the universe. The uh, the major discovery also of these dynamic models is that they generically predict an initial singularity, a start to the universe. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And so not only is the universe not static, it's not unchanging as people had assumed, but it probably has a beginning. And that's a very, very serious event because at the beginning of the universe, it's when time, space, time, space, and physics, physical particles, come into existence. Now, the static cosmologies of Einstein and de Sitter in 1917 were therefore replaced after some resistance. And it has to be said that um, one of the biggest things that Einstein made a mistake about was his rejection of the idea of an expanding universe when Friedman explained it to him. Einstein said, your, your mathematics may be right, but your physics is abominable. <laughs> This is this actually, I think, is Einstein's single biggest error. Um, but the expanding universes of Friedman Lemaitre are a family of exact solutions of the general relativity Einstein field equations, the Einstein field equations, EFE, with a very simple geometry, a Robertson Walker geometry. And these models are spatially homogeneous. That means that at a particular time, they are the same everywhere. And they're isotropic. It means whichever direction you look in the sky, on a large enough scale, things are the same in every direction. So there is no center to the universe. There's no preferred place in the universe. And there's no preferred direction in the sky at the scale of averaging when you're looking at the structure of the cosmos. So they're incredibly simple. What that means is they're basically derived by, described by a single factor, a, a function of time, which is the scale factor. You can think of it, if you like, as the size of the universe. If you take the rate of change of the factor A, you get the expansion rate, H of T, the Hubble parameter. And so there's just these two things which are really important, the scale factor, roughly speaking, the size, and the expansion rate, how fast it is expanding. That's geometry. On the physics side, it has a density, which I use the a row as the symbol, and a pressure. And these are the matter parameters which describe what is making the universe change. And then there's something called the cosmological constant, which is a property of the Einstein field equations. And this is something I will talk about later, but it's a kind of constant energy which tends to try to make the universe expand. The, the background model has three equations. There's an energy conservation equation. The, the Hubble parameter determines the evolution of the matter densities. As, as the universe expands, the matter density decays, and that's what comes from the evolution equation. Now, how fast it decays is determined by the equation of state for the pressure of matter. This tells you what type of matter there is. So the pressure is a function of the density. And that is where the physics comes in, where the matter, the, the nature of matter is determined by that equation of state. If you put that into the conservation equation one, it tells you how the density and temperature decrease as the universe expands. And that's what you expect as the universe expands. For ordinary matter, the density decreases and the temperature decreases. Um, we have observed the universe to be expanding, which means the temperature is currently decreasing. Of course, this means if you go back in time, the temperature was hotter and the density was hotter, which is a very important feature of the way the universe works. Now, the third equation is a gravitational attraction equation or an acceleration equation. And that says the acceleration is minus a constant, that's a gravitational constant, multiplying the factor, th the density plus three times the pressure plus the cosmological constant. And this is the basic equation of gravitational attraction. What it tells you is the density plus three times the pressure is the gravitational mass density. This is different from Newtonian theory where you would only have the density there. The pressure would not enter in there. It's got a negative sign, which means that if your 
gravitational mass density rho plus 3p is positive, the universe is going to be slowing down. The rate of expansion will be getting less and less as time goes on. But it's got this positive term, the cosmological constant, and that by itself will tend to make the universe speed up. So what happens is going to depend on the balance between these terms, the matter term rho plus 3p, and the cosmological constant lambda. Okay. And so the matter will cause a deceleration, that's what that minus sign means, in front of the term kappa over 2 into rho plus 3p. Now together, these determine the scale function at. So that means the matter determines the evolution of the universe. Choose the equation of state and you will get the way that the universe evolves with time. So gravity is expressed in space-time curvature, which determines the evolution of space-time. I'm not going to explain how space-time curvature enters. But if the cosmological constant vanishes, you get the three behaviors shown here. The scale factor bends downward because gravity is attractive, and three things may happen. If it's got positively curved space sections, it will crunch down to a singularity at the beginning. At the end, it will start at a singularity where the scale function is zero and the density is infinite. It will go to a maximum radius and collapse down to a second singularity at the end of the universe. If it's got negatively curved space sections, it will expand forever. And if it's just on the borderline between those two, it will have flat space sections and it will be just on the borderline between recollapsing and expanding forever. That's what happens if the cosmological constant is zero. And there's a critical density, which happens depends on the density, and that we use a factor capital omega zero to say the density today. The, the critical density omega zero is one separates the expanding ones from the collapsing ones. If it's greater than zero, it will collapse. If it's equal to zero, it's the borderline, equal to one, it's the borderline case. And if it's less than one, it will expand forever. If, on the other hand, the cosmological constant is zero, and let's just think of the cosmological constant by itself, you get an exponential expansion, which is the curve shown there. What that's happening there is the slope of the curve is increasing all the time. So you can see on the left, there's a low slope. On the right, there's a much greater slope. And so the negative gravitational energy density represented by the cosmological constant means it'll curve up, and it'll curve up more and more rapidly as time goes on, because that's the nature of an exponential curve. This occurs in the actual universe, we believe, in something called inflation at very early times, and it is happening at the present time because of what we call dark energy at the present time. So this has happened twice in the history of the universe. An anti-gravity effect is taking place at the present, and it did take place in the early universe. Now, local physics evolution at each epoch determines the background model expansion. So th there are basically three eras which we are going to look at at the moment. First, a radiation-dominated era. Remember, as we go back in the past, it gets hotter, and the radiation comes to dominate the matter. At that time, the matter is very hot, the radiation is very hot, and they get into equilibrium by physical processes, so their temperature is the same. The pressure is a third the energy density, and that means that the expansion rate is the square root of the time. The temperature decays as one over that factor, and this is a solution that was power found by Richard Tolman in the 1930s. And this is the equation of state and the expansion rate during the hot Big Bang era, which is the very hot era in the very early universe. During that time, nucleosynthesis, the creation of primordial elements, took place, leading to primordial element abundances, which I will talk about in a minute. And then, as the universe cooled, this tight coupling between the matter and radiation was broken because the matter was no longer ionized, it became atoms which do not couple to the radiation. And the radiation, which was black body radiation, again I'll show you the spectrum shortly, then decoupled, and from then on the matter and radiation went on their separate ways at later times. So you had the radiation dominated here, the hot Big Bang, and then decoupling, and after that the matter and radiation are separated from each other. You then get the matter-dominated era. This is when the matter has got the equation of state, the pressure is zero, 
Uh, now, instead of going expanding as t to the power of a half, it expands as t to the power of two thirds. And this is the Einstein de Sitter universe. And then eventually, the cosmological constant, which or dark energy takes over, and at the present time, the equation of state is p is minus rho. This is a completely different equation of state, which is equivalent to a cosmological constant. And you get an exponential expansion, as I just showed you, which is the de Sitter universe. And so what this shows you is microphysics determines the macro evolution of the co cosmos. If p, p is rho upon three, or p is zero, or p is minus rho, in these three cases, you get different expansions of the universe. So microphysics determines the macro behavior of the universe as a whole. Now, in order to compare with observations, we need observational parameters. And there are a number of them. The most important ones are the Hubble constant, which is the rate of expansion today. And a huge amount of effort goes into determining what is that rate of expansion. The second is the matter density, rho naught today, which has different components. And from that, we get a density parameter, omega, where you take the matter density, you multiply by the gravitational constant, divide by the square of the Hubble parameter, and you get a normalized one, which is dimensionless. And the critical density is what I've already talked about, is when omega is equal to 1. You get the rate of deceleration today, which is the rate of change of expansion. You get the cosmological constant. And the final one is the normalized spatial curvature. If this is less than naught, the universe is spatially closed, which means if I head off that direction and go far enough, I will come back through that door this way, because the universe has got closed space sections. The same as if I go up that way, I will come up through the floor. And if I go that way, I will come back that. This universe is a closed, like a sphere in three dimensions. If omega is less than order to have a hyperbolic geometry, which is more difficult to describe, and if omega is equal to zero, the space sections are flat. But that is unnatural in the extreme, because flat universe requires infinite fine tuning of this parameter omega k, and that is very, very unlikely. Now, in recent decades, there's been massive new observational data. Astronomy and cosmology has been transformed by the vast new data sets coming in, enabled by new technology. Charge couple devices, fiber optics, satellites, and so on. And this is masses of new data. And so we've now been able to get study the universe by electromagnetic radiation, light, infrared, ultraviolet, radio, gamma rays, from ground-based telescopes and from satellites. We've been able to observe by neutrino telescopes. The very exciting new news is we've been starting to study the cosmology by gravitational waves, which is a huge new development. And we can do statistical surveys now of vast numbers of sources because of the fiber optics. And this leads to big data, the need to deal with data streaming and massive computer analyses. And incidentally, artificial intelligence is now being used to study these great big data sets because they're very, very hard to study because there is so much data there. And the, all of this data gives us strict, uh, checks on structural formation theories and also on physics. So the point about this is that the atmosphere absorbs a whole mass of wave wavelengths. On the, there on the right are the long radio waves, which are blocked. But then short radio waves get through, which is why we have radio telescopes shown by that disk. When you move less, left, the infrared spectrum is absorbed. So you have to go above the sky and satellites to see an infrared. The visible spectrum gets through the atmosphere, as shown by that rainbow. And then on the left, the high energy rays do not get through. Gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet light is blocked by the atmosphere. And this is the reason why we needed to have satellites. And so <laughs> to present day cosmology owes a huge debt of gratitude to Werner von Braun, who is the person who really got these rockets going, enabling us to get these satellites of, above the um, sky and above the absorption by the atmosphere. Now, the first really important thing here is the cosmic microwave background. You remember the matter and radiation were in equilibrium. When they were in equilibrium, they develop what's called a black body spectrum, which is, this is a, a graph here on the left. Um, on the left, 
sorry, this is the intensity of the radiation, and this is the, the wave number. And this curve was predicted way, way back by Max Planck. This is the black body spectrum, which comes from quantum physics, uh, when you have m m a matter and radiation in statistical equilibrium. So it's given off by every black body. And this radiation was measured in the 1960s. And it's th this, what, what, is, what is there? This is the theoretical curve, which comes from Max Planck's black body spectrum. And on top of that are the measured points by the COBE satellite. And you cannot tell the difference between the theoretical predictions and what we've measured for that spectrum. This is an incredible success because it tells us that the theory of the hot Big Bang is correct because this radiation wouldn't exist unless the universe had had this very, very hot early data, uh, early epoch. So the hot Big Bang era existed. This is proof that the universe was hot in the early, at early times. But more than that, this curve comes from Max Planck's theory of quantum physics, and this proves that quantum physics was the same. 14 billion years ago as it is today in laboratories on Earth and in this room. And that is really important because the whole of cosmology depends on the assumption that physics over there is the same as physics here. We believe that the same physics which we uh, understand and study in our labs was at work in quasi-stellar objects and stars and so on very far away and a long time ago. And this curve is proof that that was indeed the case, that quantum physics was exactly the same 13.7 billion years ago. So that's a really important deduction. Now, the origin of the primordial elements took place in that hot Big Bang era. Nuclear physics processes during this era, which we can understand because we can test them in nuclear reactors, led to an epoch of nucleosynthesis when the light elements form in the early universe at a temperature of about 10 to the ninth degrees Kelvin. At that time, neutrons and protons combined to form deuterium, helium, and lithium. And these processes are very well understood. Now, the outcome depends on the cosmological expansion rate at that time. If you change the expansion rate, you'll get different outcomes from this nucleosynthesis process. And a study of these processes in detail requires that there be no more than three neutrino species. This was first found from the cosmological data and was less confirmed, later confirmed by experiments at CERN. So this is a major, uh, uh, again, uh, victory for cosmology that cosmologists first predicted that there should be no more than three neutrino species. And this was then confirmed later at CERN. What is also clear is from these studies of primordial nuclear synthesis is you cannot make heavy elements in the early universe. The point is that this is all takes place within three minutes, as um, Steven Weinberg pointed out in his book, The First Three Minutes. There isn't enough time to cook up the heavy elements like the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on, out of which you and me are made. And those could only form much later in the interior of stars and then be spread through space by supernova explosions. <clears throat> so the origin of elements is now very well understood. The light elements, hydrogen, deuterium, helium, and lithium, existed in the very early universe, and no heavier elements existed then. They had to come into existence much later on through nuclear processes in the interior of stars, and this is the basis of all the crucial elements of life on Earth, which leads to the phrase, we are all made of stardust. And this is the graph which shows how this works. This is a prediction of the density of ordinary matter relative to photons. This is the element abundances, and these are exponential changes there. And this is helium, deuterium, helium-3, <coughs> and lithium. And if you move this vertical bar left and right, there's only one value at which that measurement, that measurement, that measurement, and that measurement all agree. There's only one value of the density which agrees, and they agree if the density of baryons in terms of this normalized parameter is 0.02, which is much, much less than the critical density. Now, there are a few worries about lithium, but I'm not going to bother about those at the moment. A key set of observations in 1995, roughly, 
which won the Nobel Prize, is the following. What you've got here is the Hubble diagram, redshift, which indicates the rate at which galaxies are receding from us against the effect of magnitude, which indicates how bright they are. And that curve bends upwards. Now, if the universe was slowing down, that curve ought to bend downwards. But the data unequivocally says that the, that the curve bends upwards. And what that means is that there is currently a negative gravitational force making the universe speed up. So the universe is speeding up. There is anti-gravity present in the universe at the present time, which is what's come to be called dark energies. Now, we get this by looking at supernovas. Supernova are these massive explosions of stars at the ends of their life, and it turns out there's a type of supernova. If you measure the decay rate of the supernova, it tells you how bright they were at the top of their explosion. So decay of supernova in distant galaxies provide a usable standard candle because the maximum brightness is correlated to the decay rate. With redshifts, it gives the first reliable detection of the nonlinearity of expansion and shows the universe is presently accelerating. Consequently, there's at present an effective cosmological constant with omega about 0.7. Uh, and that is very large. You remember the critical density is one, so this is uh, two thirds of the critical density is there in dark energy, but we do not know what that dark energy is, and I will say more about that in a minute. Okay, let's turn to structure formation and top-down effects. In that basic model, in, in these cosmological models, there's an intricate interaction of bottom-up and top-down causation. Local physics everywhere determines a large scale of evolution of the universe in a bottom-up way, which is what I've just been talking about, but that evolution then acts down in a top-down way to determine the outcomes of local physics. And that's what enables the universe to provide habitats for life such as the solar system. Now, there's just one comment here. We talk about the evolution of the universe. Evolution here is the physical evolution. It's got nothing to do with Darwinian evolution. So evolution is used in a completely different way in biology. Key discovery. The rotation curves of galaxies and motions of galaxies and clusters indicate the presence of dark matter, matter which we do not see. And part of the difficulty there is that if you filled space with a whole lot of bricks, you wouldn't be able to detect them easily because they wouldn't be emitting light, which we could use to detect them. So dark matter is unseen. It does not radiate, but it's felt through its gravitational field. The density of dark matter varies with scale, but cosmology contributes about omega is 0.3. Remember, 1 is the critical amount, so 0.3 is a, roughly a third of the critical density. And its presence is confirmed by gravitational lensing observations. And there are these. So firstly, it comes from uh, rotation motion of galaxies and clusters. And this is a graph of the rotation velocity of a galaxy as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. And the measured curve that you get by looking at galaxies is that one. The, the visible matter gives you that curve if you calculate what the curve should be if the visible matter was all the matter present, you get the one, you get the bottom curve, and the difference is the dark matter. It's matter who is felt by its effect on these rotation curves, but it is not seen by any form of radiation. And you also determine that there's dark matter from cluster dynamics and structural formation. So there's a lot of this dark matter out there, which we know is there because it's a gravitational effect, but you can't see it. Now, gravitational lensing is one of the wonderful discoveries there. And what you see there, these arcs are multiple images of a galaxy way behind there, lensed by this uh, galaxy core there. It's, this, this tells you that, light, that, that matter bends light, which is something which Einstein predicted way, way back when he first formulated general relativity. And it's what Arthur Eddington confirmed in 1917. Weak gravitational lensing is used now to routinely measure the density of dark matter and to confirm that there's a lot of dark matter out there. And what happens there is you, get, is you get distortions of images because of that matter, and you do statistical analyses, and you can map the density of dark matter in this way from weak lensing statistics. 
Now, the nuclear synthesis theory and observed element abundances agree, provided the baryon density is, is low. I already said that the nuclear synthesis theory and the observed primordial element abundances agree if the density of baryons, which is ordinary matter like the matter in this room, is 0.02. The dark matter density estimates from astrophysical cosmology is 0.3. And what that tells you, there's far more dark matter than there is baryons. We are all made of baryons, OK? And so they together provide evidence for much more non-baryonic dark matter than baryonic matter in the universe. And we do not know what the nature of this dark matter is. We do know it's not ordinary matter like the matter in this room. And so there is an existence of non-baryonic particles, which is a key issue for physics, which I will return to briefly in a moment. Now, what the mathematicians then did is they took the Robertson-Walker models, these incredibly simple models, and they perturbed them to get lumpy models, which are like the smoothed out models, but have many more degrees of freedom. And this enables you to get models for the growth of structure. James Jeans, Lemaitre, and Lifshitz were the people who started this off. And there are scalar modes, which are the modes which lead to structural formation, and there are tensor modes, which is gravitational waves, which are the ones which have just been discovered. You separate them into wavelengths, and they cause anisotropies in the cosmic background radiation. So I showed you that curve of the cosmic background radiation. If you look across the sky, its temperature is slightly different in different directions in the skies, and that's caused by the matter out there, these fluctuations of the matter. Now, the result, to these fluctuations and this growth of structure depends on the following set of happenings. There is, we believe, there was a period of inflation, an exponential expansion before the hot Big Bang era. And that led to the generation by quantum processes of seeds for the structure growth at later times little fluctuations at the end of inflation, which then could be made bigger by gravitational attraction. During the hot Big Bang, there were baryon acoustic oscillations. Gravity was pulling things together, and pressure was resisting it, and you got these vast oscillations of the combined matter and radiation fluid. The radiation pressure holding it apart, and the electrons and photons being coupled, and gravity pulling it together. And so inflation generated these seas. They oscillated during the hot Big Bang era, and then decoupling took place. The radiation and matter are no longer coupled, and so then the gravitational attraction started to form stars, um, prim primordial structures which cluster together to form galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And we have out of this a very successful theory of structural formation. It's one of the great achievements of cosmologists in the last 50 years. Now, I said that there was inflation to start with. And what happens there, it gets slightly technical. There's something called a scalar field, which can possibly exist. It's basically, we think that um, in quantum physics, you can have a scalar field. It obeys an equation called the Klein-Gordon equation. And the motion of the, the scalar field is de determined by its potential. The important point about that is that that factor rho plus 3p, which I mentioned before, it's got a kinetic energy term, which is the, the rate of change of the potential squared, minus the potential term there. And if this is very small, then this term is negative because v, v will be positive. And so this can be, become negative. So slow rolling is when this term is less than that one. And then you have got anti-gravity. And so Alan Guth discovered we could have had this exponential expansion again. You remember the curve I showed you in the very, very early universe before the hot Big Bang time. So the active gravitational mass of scalar fields can be negative. And now most cosmologists believe there was a huge exponential expansion. The universe expanded by a factor of 10 to the 25, a huge, huge number for a very, very brief period, 10 to the minus 30 seconds, before the hot Big Bang era. That smooths out and flattens the universe. And it generates quantum fluctuations, which then provide seeds for structure formation later on, and this is a key feature of cosmology, the predictions from inflation of how structure would form by this process. So inflation, it is claimed, explains why the universe is smooth and flat. Now, I'm going to put in a caveat here, maybe not. Roger Penrose, who is a very famous relativist, 
and understands black hole entropy very well, says these discussions do not take gravitational entropy into account. And if you take into account the fact there could have been a huge number of black holes in the early universe, he says that this theory does not work and does not explain why the universe is smooth like most other cosmologists believe. So there's a controversy there about whether this works or not. In any case, there has to be this field, this field phi with a potential V, which is called the inflaton. And one of the things we do not know is what the inflaton is. At the moment, there's no unique candidate, and I will come back to that in a while. Now, galaxy surveys. What is very, very difficult when you see a galaxy, you remember the Hubble Deep Field, you had all those images in the sky. The question is, how do you determine how distant they are? You do that by measuring redshifts. That's very expensive in, ast in observational time until we got fiber optics. Nowadays, big surveys like this, this, this is the distribution in distance in the sky of galaxies. And so you're looking at a cross section in sky, and so that's a great big wall, those are voids, and so on, as you go out in two opposite direction in the skies. It takes a huge amount of time and effort to do the to do the observations leading to this picture. Now what you do then is you then analyze this statistically. And you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation across the sky, and you get these tiny, tiny fluctuations. You get some cold spots there and some hot spots there. Now, this is our own galaxy, which you must ignore. And you must look at this, and you'll see all of those fluctuations. Those are the density fluctuations which led to the formation of galaxies at later times. And so this is the microwave background radiation, and isotropy at one part in 100,000, the primordial fluctuations that started off at the end of inflation. They went through that process of oscillation, and they ended up on the last scattering surface like this, and they led, led to the growth of galaxies and cluster of galaxies. Now, what you do is you, you take those matter uh, pictures I showed you there, you do statistics, and you get the power, the amount of power at each wave number. So wave number goes this way, wave length goes that way, and you find it has a peak there, and then there's a bump there, which you can't see, which is the baryon acoustic oscillation. And that is the amount of power in the scale of fluctuations which lead to, uh, which, which is the amount of energy in, in, in homogeneities such as galaxies and cluster of galaxies in the universe. That's the matter power spectrum. And you look across the sky, that picture we just looked at there, and you analyze it into angles, the amount of power at different angles. And here, this is large angles on the left and small angles on the right. And this is the amount of power, and this is the top curve. And you get an incredible agreement between theory and observation. The curve there is a theoretical curve, which comes from inflationary cosmology, which I was just talking about. And there are only a few parameters which lead to that curve. And it agrees with all of those data points. It's the most wonderful achievement of cosmological theory that you can fit that data through this very complicated set of peaks, which is basically the, the result of those oscillations. This is basically the, the baryon acoustic oscillation peak at last scattering. And you can get this agreement between the theory and the observation in a most spectacular kind of way. Now, the result here depends on the global parameters. So if you vary the parameters of the cosmology, you will change the peak, the position of the peak, and the height of the peak. So the cosmology parameters change that curve. This is an environmental effect. The expansion AT of the background model determines the rate of growth of structure. The global parameters, the density, and the Hubble expansion rate determine the outcome of local physical evolution as expressed in that curve there. In a static universe, you will get an exponential growth of the density of matter. In a power law expansion, you get a power law growth. And so this is the famous picture here, how much matter there is in terms of this normalized parameter and the dark energy or the cosmological constant going vertically. Which, so this is what's causing the, the, the acceleration is the amount of dark energy, and this is the amount of matter. From the supernova, which I showed you, you get this curve in this diagram. It says that omega matter lies somewhere in there and omega dark energy in there. That's the area which comes from the supernova observations. The cosmic background and isotropies give you that curve there. And the clusters, the growth of structure, 
<coughs> the power structure curve gives you there, and they all agree in that point there. And that gives you that the amount of matter is about 0.3, and the amount of dark energy is about 0.7. This supernova one is what you get by standard candles. That's a direct test of the geometry by how bright the supernova look. And so that doesn't use structural formation. It's a direct test of the geometry using the supernova as a standard candle whose brightness we can estimate. By contrast, this one comes from structural formation studies, and this one comes from the effect of the structural formation on the cosmic background radiation. And what you can see is by far the best limits on the current cosmology parameters. If we got rid of the supernova, it wouldn't improve the fit at all. The best estimates come from the clusters and the cosmic background radiation. In other words, they come from the fact that the cosmological parameters, omega matter, which is a large-scale parameter and the dark energy large-scale parameter, those two parameters act down on the clusters, cluster formation, and, the, and then on the cosmic background radiation. And so the best fits we have on the data come not from direct observations of cosmology, but from the top-down effects of the cosmological expansion on structural formation. So we get a concordance model, expanding perturbed Friedman and Mater models, evolves from a hot Big Bang era when nucleosynthesis took place preceded by inflation. The universe has nearly flat space sections, as ex expected on the basis of inflationary theory, which flattens the space sections. The total density is the matter density 0.3, the cosmological, which is dark matter, the cosmological uh, dark energy density 0.7, it's about one, which means it's almost flat. Both dark matter and dark energy are important at late times, but their nature is unknown. The Hubble parameter is 72.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and the age of the universe, 30.7 times 10 to the ninth years. There's a tension between close and far estimates of the Hubble constant, which still needs resolution. I'm not going to talk about that. So the different eras, the quantum gravity era, which comes before inflation, which I haven't talked about. Inflation, the source of structure, the hot Big Bang, radiation dominated, decoupling, matter dominated era, structure formation, dark energy dominated era, acceleration, the present time and the future will probably expand forever. And that's represented in this picture here. Quantum fluctuations, inflation, decoupling, the dark ages before stars start, and then the formation of stars, planets, galaxies, and the present time, 13.7 billion years. So key issues are unanswered. What's the nature of dark matter? What's the nature of dark energy? What's the nature of the inflaton, the particle causing inflation? And where? what's the nature of gravity? And was there a start to the universe? We've got all sorts of theories for dark matter, massive compact halo objects, which might be black holes, faint stars, or planets. Gravitational lensing rules most of them out, but they could be primordial black holes of asteroid size. They could be particles of various kinds, weakly interacting massive particles, ultralight axions, neutralinos, supersymmetric particles of neutrinos. Um, many observational particle detector and astronomical searches have been done to try to work out which of these is the correct dark matter components, and these have we have not found out what the nature of dark matter is, despite a huge amount of effort by a lot of people. Uh, in the future, as Joe Silk has suggested, we should search for via 20 centimeter absorption lines. To get the signal that is needed, you will have to go to the far side of the moon, the dark side of the moon, because then you're not interfered with by radio emissions from the Earth. But one possibility is that the problem is we're using the wrong theory of gravity. Maybe we need modified Newtonian dynamics or something similar. So always one must bear in mind, these predictions have always come from assuming Einstein's theory of gravity. Maybe what we've got to look at is that we've got the wrong theory of gravity. So that's one of the things which one has to look at. Equation of state for dark energy. Now, it might be a cosmological constant, but it might be a dynamical field, something called quintessence, like the inflaton, which changes with time. And if so, what's its equation of state? And what people do is they say, let the pressure be a cons of, of something, a, 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 an amount W times the density. And this is a model for how the pressure and the density relates, where W is something which has to be determined. If W is minus 1, you've got the cosmological constant. But if you do a relation like that, there's no real physics in it. Um, 
you can't do direct tests on the cosmological constant because its effect on the solar system scale is too small. Now, what is happening here when you do a, uh, when you, when you do a relation like that and then you, you, do ob you, you do a lot of observational tests to find out what value of W will fit the observations. You're not actually doing real physics. What you're doing is running the field equations backwards. So let me explain. I've explained normally what you do is you take the pressure density relation, you run it forwards to find the scale factor as a function of time. I've explained how that works. But what you can do alternatively is run the field equations backwards. You can take A of t and work out from it what relation there would give you that function A of t. This is what is called the Singh trick. And this is actually what happens in a lot of cosmological analysis at the moment in time for both inflation and for um, dark energy. You run the field equations backwards and you find out what relation here would, is, is implied by the observed evolution of the universe. And you can get almost any behavior you want by adjusting the equation of state by, by running the field equations backwards in this way or in the case of a scalar field by choosing the potential V phi. And this is what is happening both as regards the inflaton, the inflationary particle, and dark energy, with one exception I'll mention briefly. So there's no real physics in this, it's just phenomenology. You're just fitting a model, but it's not tied into real particle physics in a fundamental way. The dark energy equation of state, there's just one point I want to point out. Momentum conservation equation for a perfect fluid determines the acceleration. Now, the pressure gradient causes acceleration and the inertial mass density is the energy density plus the pressure, which in terms of this quantity W is the density into one plus W. Now that's got a very important feature. If W is less than minus one, the density plus P is minus, it's negative. And what that means, this is the inertial mass density. So it means if you discover from your analyses of the curves out there, that the preferred value for W is, minus one, is less than minus one, you then got matter with a negative inertial mass density. It means if you push it that way, it goes the opposite direction. It also has a property, if it expands, the density goes up instead of going down. Now that is a very, very problematic. And in my opinion, means it's unphysical, but there's quite a lot of observations out there by people trying to find out what the equation of state of dark matter of, of dark energy is, which suggests that W is less than minus one. I regard that as really problematic, and that indicates that maybe we really should be looking more seriously at alternative theories of gravity, because I think we've got a problem if W is less than minus one. There's another problem with, with the cosmological constant. If you take quantum field theory, our best theory of fun, in fundamental physics, and calculate the energy density associated with it, you calculate, as Steven Weinberg did and other people did, a huge vacuum energy about 10 to the 70. Now you'll notice that's a great deal more than one. If that gravitates, which most people believe, then this would cause the universe to close up, to, to, to be expanding at an incredibly greater rate than it is. There wouldn't be any structures of any kind in it. And these are two of our best tested theories, quantum field theory on the one hand and general relativity. If you put them together in the obvious way, they give you a result which is a blatant violation of what we actually see out there. Uh, and any full quantum theory of gravity should have this as, it, as its limit. So the issue is, does the vacuum, quant, vacuum gravitate? Does, does a quantum field theory vacuum gravitate? If so, we have a very serious problem. This is the vacuum energy disaster. Equation three I had before shows that rho plus three p is the active gravitation mass mass density is hugely negative, and if we include it as a source, the equation is a disaster. The way around this is to use something called the trace-free Einstein equations as an alternative, and that vacuum does not gravitate if we use the trace-free equations plus separate conservation equations, which is something called unimodular gravity, and then the vacuum does not gravitate. So I think this is a really important issue there. There is a problem, but you can solve it. The nature of gravity. In Newtonian gravity, there's an inverse square law and there's no gravitational waves. In general relativity, there's a curved space-time with a Newtonian limit and gravitational waves traveling at the speed of light. But there are many more general theories we can take. Something called scalar tensor theories modify Newtonian theory. And it is crucial for cosmologists to test these alternative theories and see 
if maybe on a cosmological scale we can test gravity more than we can do within the solar system and maybe solve some of these problems, dark matter or dark energy, maybe dark energy comes because we're using the wrong theory of gravity. So that's an important point. As well as this, we need quantum gravity theories for the very, very early universe. Okay, limits of testing. They're visual, causal, and experimental limits that restrict our ability to test our models so we cannot determine important aspects of cosmology such did it have a start, the nature of its beginning, and whether a multiverse exists. There are limits to what can be observed by any kind of radiation, whatever. In space, the visual horizon, matter currently at about 42 billion light years, cannot be seen. You cannot see further than that because light propagates at the speed of light to us since decoupling. Light can only have propagated that far since the decoupling of matter and radiation. In time, we can't see to times before the decoupling of matter and radiation, except in principle by neutrinos, which we won't be able to detect, or primordial gravitational radiation, which we won't be able to detect in practice. So the observable universe is strictly limited. The matter that we can see cannot have been affected by anything beyond our particle horizon, the furthest distance that can have had any causal effect on anything we can measure. The physics horizon is a limit to what is testable in the laboratory and in the solar system. We have to extrapolate known physics to domains where they are untested and may indeed be untestable, and different extrapolations are possible with different outcomes. Hence, uncertainty increases in the very early universe and testability declines. Particularly, this applies to theories of creation of the universe. We cannot have a test of how the universe was created because this occurred before the universe existed. And so you can't do any test in a laboratory of a theory of creation of the universe. You can extrapolate known physics to where the physics did not exist because physics doesn't exist before space and time exist. This is the problem about theories of creation of the universe and how do we handle this? Um, Inflation isn't settled because we don't know what the inflaton is. It does not, in fact, solve the smoothest problem, as I've, suggest, uh, as I've mentioned, according to Roger Penrose. There is one case in which inflation is really tied solidly into standard physics, and that is if we have Higgs in, as the inflaton. If the Higgs field, which we know exists, we've tested it, we've seen it, if that is the inflaton, then you can use that as the inflaton, and you, and you can get a magnificent unification of macro and microphysics, because if this was the case, if the Higgs was the inflaton, then the particle which causes mass at the micro scale would also be causing structural formation at the macro scale by governing inflation, and you would get an incredible unification of small scale and large scale uh, dynamics of the universe. This is consistent with observations. It requires something called non-minimal coupling with a very large coupling constant, which some people say is not natural and so should be discarded. Um, personally, I don't think that's a good argument. Why should we expect so-called natural coupling constants? And this is a philosophical assumption which can often be wrong. And there's a very interesting book by Sabine Hossenfelder about this called Lost in Maths, which talk about this. Um, <clears throat> Was there a start to the universe? Yes, in the Robertson-Walker models in standard matter, but they have very high symmetry. Is that the reason for the singularity, the fact that these models have such a high symmetry? Rotation and acceleration might stop it. Well, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking proved these theorems, saying gravitational effects would be so strong in the early universe as to imply there must have been a singularity according to classical gravity, if suitable energy and causality conditions hold. But that can just be taken as a statement that a quantum gravity epoch must have occurred, and we don't have a good theory of quantum gravity. There's some proposals, string theory, loop quantum gravity, several other ones. We don't know which of those is correct. And loop quantum cosmology, for instance, says there wasn't a singularity. It's not clear what string theory and M theory says. So whether the universe had a start or not is not very clear. The emergence of complexity. Complexity, such as life, can only come into being under very restricted circumstances. In the end, we cannot answer purely from the science why the universe is hospitable for life. We can say that genuine emergence took place, new information came into being that was not there at the start of the universe. I've already said primordial perturbations gave you astronomical structures, gravitational instability gave you galaxies, stars, and planets. Life arose, we do not know how, and then evolved by Darwinian processes to more and more complex forms. I want to give you three statements. 
The specific outcomes that actually occurred are not predicted by detailed knowledge of data at the start of the universe. Why? Because of quantum uncertainty. There's irreducible randomness in outcomes, and you cannot specify initial data to infinite accuracy. Two, genuine emergence takes place with real causal power. Why? Because new information comes into being that was not there at the start. DNA, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, the existence of laws and of money, the internet, all came into existence. That is information which was not there at the last scattering surface. It does exist now, so new information comes into existence that was not there in the early universe. Statement three, top-down causation modulates how this happened. The nature of the universe affects what happens in it, and I've already given you some examples. Um, just as to the first one, these fluctuations here were subject to quantum uncertainty, which means you cannot predict if you knew fully the data of the universe at the start there. Sorry, this arrow should point there. If you knew the state there, you cannot predict which specific galaxies would exist up here because quantum fluctuations give you uncertain outcomes. And one of the most important experiments there is the two-slit experiment here, which shows that physics cannot predict which particular spots will appear, appear on the screen in this two-slit experiment. Um, Genuine emergence means physics is not all there is and does not characterize all forms of causation in the real universe. You cannot derive any of the following from physics. Physics allows them, but does not allow you to derive them. Darwinian evolution, cell signaling circuits and gene regulatory networks, the functioning of physiological systems such as the heart, the causal power of money, and the effectiveness of plans and thoughts. Biological, social, and mental forms of causation all coexist with physics causation in a hierarchically compatible fashion. And top-down effects. Nuclear synthesis, I've already said, depends on the primordial expansion rate, structural formation. I've talked about that. Olbers paradox, the dark night sky necessary for life on Earth, which was a problem in early cosmology, is resolved because the night sky temperature is now 2.75 degrees Kelvin. Max principle, the origin of inertia, and the arrow of time. What the special initial conditions at the start of the universe give a preferred time direction out of time symmetrical physics. The deep questions, why is the universe biofriendly providing a context for life to exist? How did the universe come into being, and why does the universe exist? Significant alterations of either physical laws or boundary conditions at the beginning of the universe would prevent the existence of intelligent life as we know it in the universe. If physical laws were altered by a remarkably little amount, no evolutionary process at all of living beings would be possible. So these laws appeared fine-tuned to allow the existence of life. Why is the universe biofriendly? In particular, why is the cosmological con constant lambda so small that it allows galaxies to form? And the proposal which many make is because we live in a multiverse with it, the laws of physics varying from bubble to bubble. Uh, there's no direct proof for the multiverse, not even possible in most cases because of the visual horizons. Eternal inflation predicts all possible outcomes, hence and it can explain anything whatever, hence no observation can disprove it. It's claimed because of scale of field dynamics, but we don't know what the field was. The physics isn't tested, as I've said, it's run by the Singh trick backwards. It's claimed for anthropic reasons, particularly the value of the cosmological constant, explaining why there's a bio-friendly universe, but it does not solve the anthropic issue for the following reason. It just displaces it up one level. Why is the multiverse bio-friendly? I can easily construct for you multiverses in which no universes in the multiverse are bio-friendly. Why are the constants which govern existence of galaxy in the multiverse, why are those bio-friendly? The multiverse can, has extravagant claims about infinities. Any claim about infinities is unprovable by any conceivable observation, and in my view, is a philosophically unsound claim. Um, how did the universe come into being? It's not a scientific question in the ordinary sense. Why? Because we can't do any relevant experiments or make any relevant observations. We can make theories, but we can't test them, except weakly in terms of later results. But inflation wipes out relevant data almost completely. The project is badly underdetermined by the data. Also, because before space and time existed, there were no physical laws as we know them. They depend for their very nature on the existence of space and time. You can't state the physical laws when space and time don't exist. 
Thus, we can't make theories of the form it arose as a quantum fluctuation, as that presupposes the existence of space-time in which those fluctuations took place. It has not answered how the universe came into being. If we claim it arose because of the laws of physics, we must explain where or how those laws existed before space-time existed, indeed in a context where the word before has no meaning. Why does the universe exist? Why is there anything at all? And why are there laws of physics? These are also not scientific questions. These are philosophical issues, which can be discussed in philosophical terms. But there's no experiment that can relate to either how or why the universe exists, why there's anything at all, or why there are laws of physics. And that is because the, any experiment relies on the existence of the universe, on the existence of something, and the existence of physical laws. We can extrapolate some or other aspect of physical existence to speculate an answer to these questions, but there's no way to prove that the answer we give is correct. Different extrapolations are possible, leading to different outcomes. So there's nothing wrong with doing those extrapolations. But we must separate physics and philosophy. One should always be clear whether one is engaged in strictly scientific argumentation or rather in a wider discussion of a philosophical nature based on and taking into account that scientific discussion. Some of my colleagues are failing to make this distinction, presenting philosophical viewpoints and speculations as if they were scientific conclusions. Science relates to testable theories that can be disproved by observation or experiments of some kind, in my opinion. Statements, for example, about the universe originating for nothing are not of this kind. That cannot be tested in any kind of way which I can imagine. So reprise, major questions in physical cosmology. What are the cosmological parameters? Are there conflicts? There is a problem with the Hubble constant, which needs resolution. What do they tell us about inflation? That's a huge amount of work going on. Is the universe open or closed is a very, very interesting question. Is the parameter omic k, the spatial curvature, positive or negative? It makes a huge difference. How does structure formation take place? There are some minor conflicts about that, but those are probably not going to be resolved. What's the nature of dark energy? We don't know. What's the nature of dark matter? We don't know. What's the mechanism of baryon, antibaryon, asymmetry? That's another one I haven't mentioned. Did the universe have a start? We don't know because at the, at the end, we can do theories of the, the start of the universe based on the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, the wave function of the universe, but that's not a full theory of quantum gravity. We do not know what the full theory of quantum gravity is, and therefore we do not know if there was in fact a start to the universe. And so there is our us, the astronomers, trying to see beyond the visual horizon 